Tonight we're going to delve into the macabre of Victorians with our lecturer Sandy Wilhoy, lead tour guide and historian here at the Gaslamp Porter Historical Foundation, and Jamie Laird, our visitor services coordinator. Good evening and welcome to our fond recollections of customs of something very dear and to be relished by our Victorian ancestors, funerals. Come with Jamie and I as we draw back the dark veil. Where is it? Oh. Jamie has it. Ooh. We could do it without the lights. We could turn the lights down. The widow. Now, as far as dressing for success, make no bones about it. The most important person at this funeral soiree wasn't the deceased. No, indeed, it was the widow. And heaven forbid she should disgrace her husband. Oh dear, did I just make a pun? Well, sounds like, it. sounds like it, yes, I'm good at puns. Just to make sure you pay attention, the person who can correctly guess the number of puns we make tonight will get one of these nice prizes. So pay attention, listen and count. Well, no male mind can imagine the great responsibility of being a widow in crepe. It is the hardest to wear neatly, to keep clean, and by far the most expensive fabric to buy. <coughs> Entire costumes of crepe over silk were common for all degrees of bereavement. However, time was of the essence. As my friend Emily Dickinson said, the bustle in a house the morning after death, the solemnest of industries enacted upon earth. As the newly minted widow was not supposed to leave the house until the funeral, mourning attire had to be brought to her. For those of some means, there was the professional widow, and she would arrive bearing um, different dresses, a nice selection, underclothing, petticoats, corsets, shoes, bonnets, gloves, and veils. For those less affluent, a seamstress, seamstress would arrive with a selection of fabrics and perhaps some dresses that could be easily altered. Now things start from the bottom up, of course. Underclothing was aptly black silk. That was followed by black petticoats, a black dress or suit, black gloves, black bordered hankies and a reticule or purse, and a black veil, and a bonnet, or a hat. That's all it took to complete the outfit. <laughs> the veil was designed to cover the widow from head to below the waist, all the way around. After three months, she could pin the veil back a bit. And after six months, she could ditch the veil completely and replace it with something a little more stylish. A nice hat. However, for at least one year, and preferably two, she was required to wear black, with only black jet or pearl jewelry for adornments. Now the outfit I'm wearing, you can tell by looking at me that, oh, her husband must have died six months ago. I do have all the requisite black garments. And these two necklaces actually are Victorian funerary beads. They were not worn by the corpse, they were worn by a widow. Yeah. Okay, this lovely necklace, although not Victorian, was Victorian inspired and made for me from one of the ladies that's here tonight, Cindy. And this necklace, which is actually a poison necklace, belonged to my grandmother. But she did not poison my grandfather. <laughs> I just thought I'd let you know. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And then there were some widows, as in the case of Queen Victoria, and they elected to wear black for the rest of their lives. 
and other widows, primarily those that, you know, because of financial straits, were eager to replace the mourning veil with a wedding veil. But in many instances, widows were viewed a little ambiguously. Um, most people felt sorry for them. However, the younger ladies were a little bit torn and viewed them with some trepidation because after all, now they owned property and they were sexually experienced. <laughs> Cosmetics also came into play. You know, you had to have a, a kind of a nice pallor. So face powder with arsenic to give you that nice pale cast was very popular. The most well known was Laird's. Sorry, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it had arsenic in it and that was poisonous. So you, you had to use just a little because you didn't want to end up lying in state next to your husband. And again, favorite brand, Laird's. Some widows replaced their wedding band with a black band and calling cards and stationery all had black borders and were ordered immediately so that they could begin their formal and very public show of sorrow. This of course was accompanied with much trepidation, much hand wringing and uh, you know much worrying. And now that we've dressed the widow, let's talk about the other person at the uh, party. <laughs> the corpse. Well, he has to be properly dressed too. And um, after all, he is one of the main actors in this little moribund drama. And fashions for the dead also had to have decorum. Decorum had to be maintained at all costs. And to bury a corpse undressed or, or simply in a winding sheet, that was considered not only unchristian, but heartless. Additionally, a corpse was rarely buried in his or her own clothing or in casts off from another person. Because you see, the Victorians thought this was very unlucky. And they thought as the clothes then would decay, the original owner of the clothes might follow suit. Please excuse that pun. <laughs> well, let's talk about the gentlemen. Okay, some of their outfits, in fact, most of them were backless. Yes, backless. And um, it's a lot easier to dress the corpse if they were backless, especially if the rigor mortis had already set in. So the suit would be elegant and uh, very showy on the front. And of course, it would be tucked in under the bare back. Now the proper attire was a black coat and trousers and um, a white vest and a tie. Now as far as women's burial ground, the gowns, we did it again. We, we had a little more, um, a little more leeway because the gown would be determined by the person that dressed her. And it might be somebody personal, so it would be a personal preference. Or it could be some kind of favorite attire that would designate her service or her station in life. Now, something that's very important, and believe me, they still are, shoes. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about shoes for the dead. And they were a very important part of a corpse's wardrobe. I mean... They needed them um, to walk the thorny path to salvation. First of all, they were laced in both the front and the back because feet swell after death, just in case you wanted to know that. And they were either made out of cardboard or knit so they would stretch. In fact, there was quite a business in corpse shoes. I mean, the corpse business was alive and well, it was a, a just thriving enterprise. And what they would do would have 12 to 15 uh, factory girls, and they would work about 12 hours a day 
making these shoes. And there were two main Corps shoe businesses, one in Chicago, one in Michigan. And shoes did come in four colors and materials from silk to satin to yarn. And of course, let's be practical. Some people couldn't afford these things. So let's talk about less expensive burial garments. There was the burial dicky. I bet you remember those from the 70s, yes. And they kind of only covered the front and only covered them from the waist up. Well, that was the only part that showed. And it's a lot cheaper. So they call these things sham suits. You know, they were practical. You didn't need to waste a lot of fabric. And that takes care of the participants in the drama. Okay, so now we will go to the local trade. After the doctor had come and declared the corpse legally dead and made sure there was no life left in the corpse and the mourning crepe was hung on all of the walls and the bedrooms and the windows, a series of mortuary professionals would come to help, it help the corpse make the journey from the parlor room to the crypt. Now when I hear the word undertaker, who is the main woeful trade in this drama, I usually uh, think of something like this. <laughs> um, that is the, the stereotype that I know a lot of people see. However, a Victorian undertaker looked more like this. It was all fancy like that. Um, so the undertaker was also called a mortician a funeral and a funeral director. And he was essential in ensuring that everything um, from when the deceased was declared dead was um, safe to transport them from the, burial, from the burial parlor to the crypt. So based on the media from the era, all of the newspapers, the undertaker was not the grim figure that we see here. Mm -hmm. He was actually a jolly fellow and people would do stories about them, often highlight, highlighting the main or the oldest undertaker, asking about changing trends from the era and any stories that they would have that were popular regarding his job undertaking. Uh, there's also, there was also a business for it, and this is an ad from um, the Victorian era that advertised the undertaker, as you could see. He does not look like the grim guy. He actually is there with his fancy uh, carriage there. And then we've got the next one, the grave digger. The grave digger is very essential and important, of course. You need a place to put the casket. The stereotype for the grave digger was often the ones from Hamlet. And they were very jokesters, but very superstitious as well, and kind of creepy guys. But in reality, they weren't too far from the truth. Um, the ones portrayed in the Victorian newspapers were similar. They did have their superstitions, and they were, I guess you can say, kind of odd. But they often, they often had sort of a sarcastic and gallows humor. So they were pretty entertaining, if you ask me. <coughs> Another one is the, the watchman. So a watchman, what they did was they patrolled the graveyards at night. And they, so not only in the Victorian era was it a fear to be buried alive, but was also a fear that the anatomists, who were growing big in those days, the body snatchers would come and steal your body and sell you to an anatomist so they can discover what sort of secrets the corpse held. Mm -hmm. So the watchmen were employed, and what they did was they patrolled the graveyards at night, uh, often with their, their lantern and a few weapons, and they made sure that everything was good. They made sure no body snatchers were there. Um, it was the most dangerous job because the body snatchers were not afraid to exchange gunfire if they could make that quick buck. Um, it was dangerous because the, the best time to rob a grave was when it rained and when it was dark. So that often made the terrain very hard for not only the grave diggers, but also the watchmen to run and catch them. Um, this guy is one of the last watchmen um, from England here. And 
Also, another thing that was what was dangerous for the watchmen was they had to be a very power, or a very um, tough type of breed. Because when you're sitting there in the graveyard all night staring at all the tombstones, your mind is bound to play tricks on you. So they were often uh, succumbed to tombstone and madness, was what the sickness was called for them. There was also something called a tombstone sensor. So their job was to make sure that, their, that decorum was always taking place in the graveyard. No blasphemous statements on any of the headstones. For example, one woman wanted to write on her husband's headstone that he hired a cheap doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so the tombstone sensor was there to make sure that that did not happen. That none of the tombs, that they were all kept very proper and not marred by blasphemous statements. A noteworthy fad was also a stenographer. Um, also, what I liked about this occupation was that it was open to women. It was considered a very noble position because they were often hired by well-to-do families. And basically, their job was just to go to your, fu your funeral and take notes. Uh, well-to-do families wanted records of everything. So they would go there, <coughs> take notes about what happened, especially the eulogies. So for the funerals, we have all of those key players. We also had uh, a few people that would go in and join the festivities. The main event, the funeral. We have the amateur mourners. <laughs> the amateur <laughs> mourners. Have you guys ever heard of wedding crashers? <laughs> so basically, the amateur mourners were funeral crashers. Yeah. In, in the Victorian era, funerals were a big thing well-to-do thing that everybody wanted to participate in for some reason. So the amateur mourners would go, and they were sort of known as funeral aficionados. They would, they would um, go in and join the festivities. They would cry. They would dress up. They would often be in the front row kind of drawing attention to themselves. Basically, they thought it was kind of a something to do, a fun party. So they would join in there and <laughs> amateur mourners. <laughs> Uh, but with amateur mourners, we also had professional mourners. That's what they looked like. There was even a bureau for professional mourners in a lot of big cities and also in Europe. When you had a, a funeral, especially for important, well-to-do people, you would not want to hold a big event and have a bunch of gaps in there where nobody showed up. That would be quite embarrassing. So what people would do was they would hire professional mourners to come in and fill in those gaps for you. They would come in, they'd lead the procession, they would cry, whatever you needed them to do, they were there. So with the Victorian era, the Civil War happened and a lot of people lost their lives, a lot of people lost loved ones. And so that is how the funerals got so big. Um, the Civil War marked a huge shift in funerary practice from very austere ceremonies to mortuary extravagance. So like Victorian weddings, funerals were often held at the home. But as they grew bigger and more elaborate, they were often held in churches or something that we now know as funeral parlors. The more elaborate your funeral was, the more elaborate your funerary flowers were. So these are some examples of a few of the arrangements um, that they had. You could see that the flowers are arranged in the name. They also had a photo in there. That one on the side is very extravagant. It's, it's arranged in a heart. Um, as this fad grew, the newspapers would document how elaborate these, these flowers were and how elaborate these funerals were. And it was as if they were keeping score for the next bereaved family. So if your funeral wasn't as extravagant as this one, then what were you doing with your life? So um, that is how they kept score for that one, for the elaborate funerals. Okay, now that we've talked about the players and the party, let's talk about some of the fetishes and the fancies. Something I love to talk about, jewelry to die for. That's something very dear to my heart and that I'm dying to display. And I've already showed you all these fancy things. Jamie also is wearing funerary beads that are hand-tied. 
Now, something they really liked was what we just showed you, the hair wreaths and the jewelry. And you know, there's nothing more personable and, and intimate than someone's hair. I mean, that's really a remembrance. Gives you a feeling of closeness and it's crafted into an art form. In fact, Godey's Ladies Book, and that was just the premier ladies book of the time, they even every month would have a pattern in their book to make um, hair jewelry. And what they uh, advised you to do was twist it around a wire frame. And you could have bracelets, you could have brooches, you could have lockets, you could have rings for the gentlemen watch fobs or you could even have buttons. Although most of the ladies prefer to have their buttons made out of black jet. Now, sometimes the families would do one that had the whole family's hair in it. But you know, they didn't dye all at once. So what they had to have was a um, hair receiver. So every time somebody died, they'd snip off a little piece, dump it in the jar, and wait till they had one that, you know, they thought would make a fine display. It was sort of like a family history told by hair. Wreaths, of course, and they could even look, they could even display them and put them under a bell jar. I mean, you can tell that family's whole history by looking at all that hair. Uh, the wreaths, even though they call them wreaths, weren't really round, they were U-shaped. And of course, if this was a family wreath, you'd have the father in the middle because he was the most important then. And sometimes they even crafted these into like hair-raising three-dimensional sculptures <laughs> like this one that they could, like I said, display. They also had memorial busts. Now, towards the end of the Victorian era, uh, cremation became popular, believe it or not. And so what they did was they took the cremains and mixed them up with um, silicate of soda and then molded this mixture into a bus of the defunct. That way it could be displayed prominently and you know, everybody could gather around and uh, spend some time with Father, who was, take a selfie. yes, take a <laughs> selfie. He was not forgotten and not exactly gone either. Now one woman carried this a bit further. She had the cremains of her husband made into a, a, a little head of him, and she had this put on the top of her walking stick. And that way they could walk through eternity together. Isn't that sweet? Well, something also very popular was post-mortem photography. This is sort of capturing the corpse for all eternity. Now you see, the cost of photos and then also getting the whole family together was very difficult. So it, this was a perfect opportunity. You had to make the most of your time allotted and you had to include everyone, both living and dead. Um, there were several props, and the props were like, um, kind of like doll stands. And they used those, st and then they used belts to secure them. They also painted the eyes open. Now, here's a lovely family, and I bet, <laughs> and I bet you can't tell which one is the dead one. Who do you think is the dead one? Let me tell you, the hands are a dead giveaway. Aww. This little gal, that sister, she's the dead one. Now here is a lovely family photo, and yes, it's the baby. I know the brother didn't look too happy. Speaking of hands and sisters, another pair of sisters. Yeah, this one. Definitely this one. Now, bet you can't guess the dead one here. Both of them. Both of them because the eyes were painted open. Again, look at Dad's hands. Now, 
This is kind of a sad one, two brothers. The living brother doesn't look too happy about holding the dead brother's hand. <laughs> and this girl, look how pretty she is, but I think they could have done a little better job propping her head up. <laughs> These two little dollies, yep, that's right, both of those little dollies on doll stands, they didn't do the best job with the second one's eyes. These two friends have decided to commit suicide together. Gives a whole new uh, vent to that term, hanging out together. <laughs> the corpse razor. Well, you had to look your best for the camera. But you know, guys didn't want to go into a barber shop and have the barber use the same razor that they just used for a corpse. So there was a special razor that they used, and it had a black handle, and it was sort of kept to the side. Now, there was one very delicate thing, though, with the shaving. You know, every now and then a lady might have a little mustache. Um, for some reason, barbers hated to shave a lady. You had to pay them extra to go to the house to shave a lady. Now, we were talking about parties and having fun at this. One of the favorite things that the Victorians liked to do was have mummy unwrapping parties. <laughs> you see, they had a fascination with anything Egyptian, and it permeated all aspects of their culture, including death. Now, I must tell you that this was usually accompanied by much drinking. <laughs> And it was for the socially elite, because, I mean, you had to have bucks to buy a mummy. Mummies don't come cheap. <laughs> However, there were a plethora of corpses, because in Egypt, not only were the rich people that lived in the cities have, you know, their bodies mummified, but there were also quite a few from the countryside. So there really wasn't a problem finding a participant for this uh, type of entertainment. The only problem was, though, especially if you got one from the, uh, the countryside, you might be in for a little surprise. Like um, one time they were unwrapping this mummy who they thought was supposed to be a rich man, and he really ended up being a rich woman. That got their attention. And uh, another one that they felt um, you know, this was a respectable mummy. Well, it was another one of those kind of cheap mummies, and he wasn't really embalmed, he was just filled with sand. So when they unwrapped him, the huge pile of sand came out. All right. Let me get out of your way. Yep. I, can't I need your mic. <laughs> oh, I can't go too far. All right, guys, so displaying the dead. We went through all of these things to make the corpse look their best because they had to display the dead. Uh, the first place that they would display the dead is at the wake. Now the wake, the reason for the wake is because the corpse could not be trusted to be left alone by themselves even though they were dead. For example, evil spirits could reanimate the body or they believed that if there was no vigil held, cat could hop on top of the body and possess it with a vampiric afterlife. So you had to have a wake to make sure that your loved ones were okay. Um, the wakes had a religious custom or they just did it out of respect for the dead and they were often communal. A lot of family and friends would sit around and drink and eat, play cards and have, you know, play games with each other throughout the night. Sometimes there were solo vigils or solo wakes held for the dead. Uh, it was very rare, but they did, they did occur. Um, oftentimes, they were followed by people kind of going a little crazy because when you stay with a dead body alone, even no matter how much you love them, your mind starts to play some tricks on you. The second, the second type of displaying the body that they had was for lessons or examples. These three guys, um, unfortunately, were display displayed. They uh, were involved in the gunfight at the OK Corral. So they would display these bodies of people to show people that out, you could not be an outlaw. Sometimes they would hang people on the gallows and leave them up there just to, 
further explain to people not to do anything wrong. With all of this comes grave errors. <laughs> um, ideally, the deathbed, a wake, and a funeral, and a burial would go totally smooth, like caramel. But many last rites actually went horribly wrong. Um, the first one was exploding corpses. Um, there's nothing pretty about decomposing. And if you're stuck in a coffin sealed up with all of your juices and gases emitting, and they didn't have time to bury you, because sometimes um, if you were poor, they wouldn't get you out into the grave in time. Um, so they would leave you there until they can find somebody to bury you. And with all of that happening inside your casket, sometimes it just explodes open. And that definitely gave a scare to some people. Didn't smell good either. <laughs> no, it did not. Um, there was also flaming formaldehyde. So one of the components of embalming a body was embalming fluid. And the main ingredient in embalming fluid was formaldehyde. It's extremely toxic. But that is how you preserve the body for all of the wakes and for the family to view them. So you would just spread that on as much as possible to give them sort of that preserving glow. Um, <laughs> however, it's extremely toxic and sometimes out of nowhere, without any help from anybody, the body would just spontaneously combust. So, um, there was also something called the whims of widows. The poor widow. She did occupy, as Sandy said, a very ambiguous position in society. She had to walk the dark, delicate line because not only did she have to take care of her family <coughs> and her husband, her late husband's business affairs, she had to do it in a very womanly, delicate way and not seem like a mannish business man, basically. Um, so basically, I said she, didn't, she couldn't be all business in bloomers. Uh, there was a popular stereotype for the frivolous widow. So I have this photo here. This is the gates of heaven. And there's a widow here who's dressed up in her riding gear, which I'll explain a little later. But she goes to the gates of heaven and she says, hey, isn't this the entrance to heaven? And the angel looks at her and says, yes, but this is the lady's entrance. Yeah. So. so they had something called the morning boudoir. And it was a stereotype that someone would not only dress up in all black, but they would also dress their rooms and their bedrooms in all black, just to take it to the next level. Um, here we have some ladies visiting their friend in her morning boudoir. They also had the morning bicycle, which was the photo prior to this one. So this was a very strange custom because it was called wheeling back in those days. Wheeling was very, um, it was not an appropriate pastime for proper women. Um, it was seen as very mannish, and it was associated with the bold suffragette movement who, all, who often wore their bloomers. Um, it was, and it was also un very unflattering for women, so they said. Uh, but for the widows, it was quite respectable. They thought that it was actually a fine pastime, a healthy way to get exercise. Um, and they had special wheeling outfits made just for them and a special morning bicycle. Black, of course. Of course. <laughs> Another grave error from the time was arsenic wallpaper. They had, <laughs> if you notice in our house as well, we have these beautiful displays of wallpaper. Um, to, uh, to get those vivid colors, what they would do is they'd sprinkle a little bit of arsenic in them. That would make the colors pop, so to speak. Um, <coughs> but it was also the cause of countless deaths. Mm -hmm. If they, wrap, if they were decorating your whole house and you were surrounded by that day in and day out, you were slowly poisoning yourself. So, and that was the cause of many deaths in a lot of households. Also from the Victorian era, there was a rise in spiritualism. Um, the Victorian era was the golden age of spiritualism. It's the belief, basically, that you can communicate with the dead. Uh, because many loved ones died due to the Civil War and all of the other things that we talked about, death was easy to come by in those days, um, the belief in spiritualism skyrocketed during this time. It gave them comfort to be able to believe, to be able to speak to their loved ones from beyond the veil, so to speak. Um, 
It was widespread in Europe and it came to the U.S. in about 1848. This is when the Fox sisters, who were well-known spiritualists and mediums, um, blew up on the scene. They held seances across the country and things like tarot cards and psychics, ghost hunting, and Ouija boards became very popular from this era. Having a seance was a social event for the socially and the rich elite. Um, we have the Ouija board that I mentioned. So though the spirit boards um, were very popular throughout the centuries, uh, spanning many cultures and um, different time periods, they were actually patented in the 19th century by a man named, a businessman named Elijah Bond. He patented the first Ouija board that we all know well today by Parker Brothers. Um, it was a very popular parlor game in those days. Also in those days, spiritual photography became popular. So you had photos of the deceased, your deceased loved ones. Um, there was a photographer and he, his name was William H. Mumler. And what he did was he took special photos of people and they were double exposures. Any sort of strange lighting in the back he claimed were your deceased loved ones still surrounding you. Spiritualism did reach the White House. Uh, Mary Todd Lincoln and Jane Pierce, who was the wife of our 14th president, Franklin Pierce, held seances in the White House when their, their children passed away. And they believed they wanted to communicate with them. Uh, it did reach our little town of San Diego eventually in 1881 with the first spiritualist church of San Diego. It did have some prominent members from San Diego. Um, some of them by the name of Horton, if you guys recognize that name. His third, his third, third way, third slash second Fourth, way. Yeah. fourth. <laughs> um, one of Horton's wives is a member of the Spiritualist Society for Sarah a long time. Sarah Babe. We also, if you guys have ever ventured to the Sherman Heights Historic District, you'll see the beautiful Victorian Queen Anne style Via Montezuma. This was built for Jesse Shepherd. He was a renowned spiritualist all throughout Europe, um, and he did musical seances. So what he, he claimed was that he could sit down at a piano and all of the spirits from uh, like Bach and Beethoven, he could channel them and play musical seances for people. So we held a few, and some known people to attend was Sarah Babe, of course, uh, Fidelia Shepherd, who was Hor uh, Alonzo Horton's cousin, and also Mrs. Edward W. Bushyhead, who was the wife of the police chief, and he was also the owner of the San Diego Union. So very prominent people took part in the spiritualist movement here in San Diego. Yeah. <laughs> Alonzo Horton even had a uh, crystal ball on his desk. He did this to humor his wife, he said, but he would invite his mm -hmm. nieces and nephews in to have a look and tell him what they saw for San Diego. Now some parting words. Little odds and ends. First of all, doorknobs always had to be covered in crepe. The clocks have to be stopped at the hour of the deceased's passing. All mirrors had to be covered to prevent the dead from being trapped. All family paintings must face the wall. The body must be taken out head first to prevent it from calling out to others. And last but not least, the family dogs must be adorned with crepe to prevent the spread of death. Now, as we take our leave and wish you a fond adieu, we'd like you all to join us in a dark treat. Chocolate. chocolate. <laughs> and we promise there will be no death by chocolate tonight. And again, for those who might wish to take home a lasting memento of the evening's festivities, we do have paper and pen, and we'll have some more at the wine table, so you get a final chance to bid. And please place your pun guesses with your name in, in one of our baskets, and we will announce the lucky winner shortly. Thank you, and remember, you are never really gone as long as you are remembered. <laughs> Thank you.
and stay tuned because the widows will be back for Valentine's Day. Only we'll be sweethearts then. <laughs> a wonderful talk very interesting join us next month for our lecture talk about the drama the stories behind the curtain at the Horton Grand Theater uh, with Kit Goldman the founder of the Horton Grand Theater so sure it'll be a good one uh, make sure you sign up for emails from us to get the locations for that and thank you all for coming chocolate